Hey, good morning, everybody. Great to have you on Facebook Live and tuning in from wherever you might be. Uh, here in Walla Walla, it's another beautiful sunny day. Uh, another scorcher, if you will. And our summer just seems to never end. <sighs> as well as lots of other things that just seem to never end. But we are here not to dwell on those things but to dwell on the good news of Jesus and his incredible love for you and his plan for you and for us and for his people and uh, his conquering sovereignty over all things we rejoice in that so uh, just a couple things to, to share with you we'll do our call to worship here in a minute and I'll pray and then we'll uh, take our three minute intermission pause countdown stuff to get situated um, call people in the room and say, hey, he's on, it started, and then we'll be back with the sermon. Um, but one of the things I, I want to remember this morning is a word from the Lord in Lamentations chapter 3. It says, his mercies are new every morning, every morning. So we don't get stale mercy from God. We don't just feed off of leftovers. He grants us that mercy every day, brand new, uh, and he never runs out. So we give praise to him for that that his grace is good and powerful and so i want us i want you wherever you're at this morning to say good morning mercy good morning grace so take a second and say good morning mercy good morning grace and if your name just happens to be grace well how about that good morning grace um, also, to let you know, remind you that we've got our songs for worship on our Facebook page, a YouTube list. So you can go to the Facebook page, click on that YouTube link, and it will take you to a playlist of YouTube songs with lyrics. And I want to encourage you after the sermon to turn that on and turn it up and sing. And even if you don't sing, which I just want to encourage you to sing, uh, but play the songs and let them wash over you and participate in them by singing. But, but let that be a part of our routine. Our, our Sundays are, are odd, and I don't ever want to call them normal because this is not normal. But it's what we've got, and it's what we can do, and so let's take advantage of all of that. And singing has been a part of God's desire for his people from the very beginning. In fact, Genesis 1, that beautiful chapter in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that whole chapter is very song-like. It's no wonder that when C.S. Lewis was writing his Chronicles of Narnia and penning the, uh, the part of the magician's nephew when we get to see Aslan creating Narnia, that he does it through song. And so I just find that encouraging and interesting and, and helpful that we would sing our praise to the Lord as a way of letting it... Um, grip our hearts and reach into our soul more than even just talking and hearing and listening. So let those songs be a tool in the hands of the Lord for you today. Also, great to see some names popping up. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I see you all. It's wonderful. Hope you see each other. Uh, and I hope that you're at home or wherever you're at with, with some other people. I hope that you can gather with uh, at least a few other people this morning around the word and talk about it. Um, there are some things that are going to come up in our passage in 1 John chapter 3 this morning that I, I think will be really good to discuss with one another and how it plays out in your life, both with God and with others. So uh, that's, that's that. For that, let me read our call to worship, which is the entirety of Psalm 134. It's three verses. Psalm 134. This is our call to worship this morning. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let's pray and we'll start the countdown. Lord, we do come to you today um, and bless your name and praise your name and rejoice in who you are, knowing full well we don't, we don't know everything. And we are uh, confused in our life and in our world, um, but that doesn't change the fact that you are worthy of our praise. And so open our hearts today, Lord, that we would draw near to you because you have drawn near to us, um, that you would uh, open us 
to what you have to teach us from your word, that it would not be just information, but revelation, and that you would awaken and alive in our, our hearts to you. Uh, Lord, we give ourselves to you and we thank you for loving us entirely. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll be back in about three minutes. beautiful is that that the song ends right at the zero mark on the clock <laughs> uh, I find it very important and wonderful and necessary to have a little Sunday groove yeah okay well hey good to be back uh, we got a great passage to dig into this morning from the book of first John chapter 3 verses 19 through 24 so if you've got a Bible which I hope you do. And if you don't have one, let me know. I can get one to you. Um, open your Bible near the very end of the New Testament to the book of 1 John. Um, we're going to talk about a love that assures. So one of our children, uh, when little, would sit in the back of the car, in the car seat, and was not was not like a backseat driver telling me where to go and where to turn and how fast to go and when to stop and all those things but had a had a had a knack um, to always wonder if I actually knew where we were in fact going uh, it was not uncommon to hear a little voice from the back seat dad are you sure you know where you're going are you sure is this the right way and I probably should have been more honest and just said, no, 
I'm not, I'm not always that sure. Um, and for those of you who might be fairly new to Mission Church, uh, and you're tempted to ask the same thing of me, are you sure you're, you know what we're doing? Then I will just be honest and say, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but it turns out that this idea of assurance and certainty is quite a, quite a deep need in, in all of us. Um, and, you know, we are assaulted every day by dozens of issues and situations that, that make certainty and make assurance feel pretty impossible, uh, we, we look up the weather forecast. What's it going to be? Are you sure? Check it again. Are you sure? Uh, what's the status of my order from Amazon? Are you sure? Everything seems uncertain. And that's that's just the meaningless stuff. You know, then we get to talking about real life hardcore things in terms of relationships and politics and uh, the trajectory of our society and our culture. Um, and, and there's not much that that presents itself with absolute assurance. And so we, not only do we need and desire a lot of assurance and certainty, we are presented with all kinds of evidence that we can't have it. And, and I wanna just give you a little exercise as we enter into this next part of the calendar year uh, in this cycle of our country, as we vote for leaders. Um, I, I, <laughs> We, we live in a chronically anxious society so that our desire for certainty and assurance is ramped up and we look for it and we'll believe it as, as anybody tells us that they are certain. So as we watch and listen to uh, potentially elected officials uh, tell us things or movement leaders or special interest groups or anything else like that, I want you to listen for how much certainty is infused into their rhetoric and into the words they use, um, because it's a bit of a it's a bit of a bait and switch. It's a bit of a hook that we are so quick to want and need certainty that all that's required is for somebody to say, like, I guarantee this is what will happen if I get elected. This is what I'll do, and this is certain, and I'm sure, and and of course. When we're in our a better frame of mind, we can quickly say, no, you can't say that with any certainty. You can't give us absolute assurance that you're going to fix the economy or you're going to fix race relations or you're going to fix issues of justice. So you're going to you're going to fix all of those things or any of those things. But because of where we're at as a people and our natural inclinations to to want certainty, we are quick to believe it. But Here's what I fear. I, I fear that, that we demand and expect certainty from everyone around us who cannot give it, and at the same time, refuse to accept a certainty and assurance from God who alone can give it. So I want us to turn to 1 John chapter 3, <clears throat> and I'll read for us verses 19 through 24, and we'll get into this that we have a love that assures. 1 John 3, 19 through 24 says this, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him and he in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of the Lord and our word for today. So he starts this whole thing by saying, by this we shall know and by this we shall have our hearts assured or be reassured before him. Well, what, what's this this that John is talking about? He's actually 
writing this as a signal backwards to what he just said and what we talked about last week. And that is that we as Christians are to have a indeed in work and truth, in action and in truth, kind of love for one another. And that work and truth kind of love for one another is reflective and resembles the love that Jesus has shown for us and has given us. So having that uh, action and truth kind of love for one another that looks like the love that Jesus has for us, having that gives us a great assurance before our standing of our standing before God. But the reality is many of us do not experience an assurance before God. Loving one another in deed and in truth, like Jesus loved us. He's looking at me and says, by that, by this love, um, we know that we are in the truth and that and our, and our hearts are assured before him. But a lot of us don't live in that experience. So how valuable is it for you to have that kind of certainty, that kind of assurance of your heart before the presence of God? that in the presence of Almighty God, your heart is assured, is certain, is uh, uh, rock solid knowing that you belong there, you're wanted there, you're enjoyed there in his presence. How valuable is that to you? For John, for the Apostle John, now remember, John is old at this time. He's like in his 80s. All of the other uh, disciples who walked with Jesus, they've all died, some pretty gruesomely in martyrdom ways. Uh, he has watched emperors rise and fall. <laughs> he has seen false teachings and, and wonky Christianity come and go. The guy has seen it all. Nothing frightens him, nothing intimidates him, and nothing impresses him except for the love and the glory of Jesus Christ. And so for John, our dear old apostle, nothing is more valuable than this assurance before God. It surpasses all else because if we can have an immovable assurance about our acceptance and our welcome before God, if we can have that, well, then let everything else be answered with the resounding, I don't know. Hey, John, how are you going to grow the church? I don't know. How are we going to win people to Jesus in this time of, of political unrest? I don't know. But I do know, and I am fully assured, of my standing before God. That surpasses it all. And that's, that's where John takes us. And that, that's where the Lord is drawing our hearts. That when everything else is uncertain, uh, know and be assured of your heart in the presence of God. So how can we be so sure? so absolute, so unswerving in our certainty that we do, in fact, experience that, 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 that reassurance, that truth, and that we stand in a place of welcome and delight and enjoyment before God. You see, we want a heart that is fully assured before the presence of God, not a heart assured about God, not a, a, a mind that can make sense of God. We want to be in his presence before him. And that's what shows up a couple times. Um, reassure our heart before him. And we have confidence before God. This is talking about presence. This is talking about you go before him. Um, and a heart that is fully assured before the presence of God has a few things that we want to look at. And the first of them is... A heart that is fully assured before the presence of God knows that condemnation has been taken away, has been removed. I think we all know this unpleasant feeling. We, we go to God and we are immediately overwhelmed by the reality of our unworthiness before him. You know, we can, we can fake it in front of almost anybody else. I would say with the right slash wrong spirit, we can fake we can fake it before anybody. But we can't fake it before God. I mean, this did you, did you catch this line that's in the text? Uh, he knows everything. We can't fake it before God. He knows everything. 
So we, we go to God and we freeze or we stammer or we, we uh, you know, twitch and we just sort of like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, and hesitate. And then we're just super uncomfortable because he knows everything and we, we know ourselves. So we do that or, or we simply never go, be him, no, never go before him in the first place because we're just too well aware of our own sin and our condemnation. Holiness is, is, unholiness is not comfortable in the presence of holiness. Unrighteousness is not comfortable in the presence of righteousness. And God knows everything. But a heart fully assured before the presence of God knows that that condemnation has been removed. Because here's what's important to know. We aren't wrong in that situation, whether we're just uncomfortable or whether we just avoid him because of how much we know of ourselves. We're, we're not wrong. On our own, we do stand before God condemned. Uh, and we know it. And God certainly knows it. So what does it mean uh, here in this text? It says, God is greater than our heart. It just says, you know, whenever your heart condemns us, well, that's that could be pretty often for some of us. Because we know our heart. We're aware of our unworthiness. Whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. What's he mean by that? A couple things. First of all, that the condemnation that we can place upon ourselves is nothing compared to the judgment of God. Our condemnation is small. When God's condemnation is grand and huge and, and eternal and infinite, God's condemnation is immeasurably greater than what our heart can conceive. God is absolutely sovereign. He knows everything. Did you catch? He knows everything. He knows all that you've forgotten. He knows all that you've repressed. He knows all that you've worked so hard to forget. He knows everything. He knows the actions. He knows the attitudes. He knows the, 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 the tiny little uh, thoughts that flicker in your mind that that give way to making plans and, and committing actions that you know are wrong. God knows everything. God knows everything that you have done. And for the most part, so do we. And this is, this is, where, this is where we get into trouble for ourselves because we believe that if I know everything about myself and God knows everything about myself, then I must know everything. No. You know everything about yourself, and God knows everything about you. But what we don't always know about everything is what God does know. In other words, God knows everything about what you've done. And he knows everything about what he has done. So when your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart because he knows everything. So the first thing about what it means that God is greater is that his condemnation is greater. But along with that, the condemnation that we deserve has been removed. That's what God knows in the everything. God is greater than our hearts because he knows everything. He knows what he has done to remove that sin from us, to remove that condemnation and bring liberty from it. What Jesus Christ his death on the cross accomplished was a removal of that condemnation. So even though your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. Grace that is greater than all our sin. And as Psalm 103 says, he has not treated us as our sin deserves. He has separated us from our sin as far as, as east is from west. So when your heart condemns you before God, God's grace is greater. When your heart disagrees with the declared and proven love of God, don't listen to your heart. When you go before God, knowing that Jesus died for your sin to remove that condemnation, and you go before God and your heart says, no, 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 you're not supposed to be here. Look at your sinfulness. Don't listen to your heart. Listen to the word of God. In fact, this is, the, this is the time to tell your heart what to believe. This is why in the Psalms, you'll read this like, you know, uh, Oh my soul, why are you so downcast? 
That's the psalmist talking to his heart or his soul. So we tell our hearts, hey heart, you are no longer condemned. Because the word of God says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's you, heart. So there's no condemnation. It's been removed. This, this sense of condemnation or the sense of condemnation, whether real or perceived, um, is what prohibits us. It's what, what keeps us from drawing near to anyone in relationship, especially God. We, we shrink back. We're convinced, we're assured that we will not be accepted. And though this, of course, is, is uh, most notable in our relationship with God, I want to I wanna just invite you to think a minute about your relationships with other people. And when you hesitate to approach, when you hesitate to, to speak with, with plainness, and when you feel locked up and unable to really um, be free in that relationship, uh, I'm, I'm going to guess that it comes down to this sense of condemnation. I don't believe that I'm worth their friendship or I'm afraid they're going to judge me or I'm afraid they're going to uh, condemn me in some way. And that, that condemnation is what prohibits relationship. And what keeps us from stepping in and stepping forward uh, and inviting in and, and believing that we are invited. So even though, you know, of course, I want you to think about this in your relationship with the Lord, but I also want, to, want you to see how it trickles out into all of our other relationships that uh, we fear condemnation. And if, and if our condemnation before God, which is on our own, deserved and real, has been removed by Jesus so that we do not need to fear, can that trickle down into our other relationships so that we can believe there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus? And if I don't fear the Lord God's condemnation, why would I fear anyone else's? And this is what happens next in our text. You see this. Uh, he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, well, then we have confidence. So your heart fully assured before the presence of God knows that condemnation has been removed and knows that confidence has been given. <clears throat> now that your heart doesn't condemn you, look how it changes your approach to God. You have confidence before him. You, you know you belong and that God desires you to be in his presence, even though he knows everything. He knows everything about you and he knows everything about himself and what he has done to provide a way for you to be welcome and enjoyed in his presence. In this wrecked world of so much uncertainty, how wonderful is it to truly know, to truly know that you can have confidence before God. So what is this confidence specifically? Like, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a swagger? In the presence of God? No, that's not confidence. Are we talking about an entitlement to our wants and needs that we can just walk in and confidently say, Lord, here's what you owe me? No, we're not talking about entitlement. That's not confidence. Are we talking about a feeling of superiority over those who are still ensnared in sin and under condemnation? No, we're not talking about superiority. That's not confidence. This word confidence is, is really fascinating and beautiful in this, in this context and for us. The word has a particular nuance of open and plain and unencumbered speaking. Everywhere you find this particular word that is translated confidence here in 1 John 3, but where you find that, it's talking about just speaking plainly. For example, when when Jesus was uh, with the disciples and he was talking in parables, they're saying, Lord, could you please not talk in parables? Just tell us plainly. That's, that's the word. That you can just, just say it. Just say it with, with a confidence, with an openness. Uh, we're told over and over in the New Testament to approach God with boldness and confidence uh, because of the blood of Christ. This is a true and genuineness uh, openness from heart to mouth. 
No more games, no more maneuvering and saying things just right. You know, how, do, how am I supposed to say this in order to make sure God is happy with me or so that I don't upset him and don't trigger his condemnation? Gone. No more of that. That you have confidence before God. With condemnation removed and with confidence implanted, what we ask for, we receive from his good hand. And that's, that's why he goes right into that if we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. We, we have confidence before him. We may not get what we ask for all the time or within the time frame we want it. It's not always on our, it's, it's not. We go before God with confidence, meaning this is how we ask for things. And because he is so good, he does give us what we need. He does give us what we want, even though sometimes we don't know that's what we want. If we don't receive what we ask for, here's what we can be assured of. We can be absolutely assured that it is not because he is displeased with us or that we are still under condemnation. And isn't that our fear? Oh, I go to God and I pray and I ask him for things and he doesn't give that. That must mean that I'm doing something wrong and he's upset with me and I'm still condemned and he doesn't really like me. So what do I need to do to make him like me? That, that's not it. No, condemnation's removed. Confidence is given. If he's not giving you what you're asking for, it's not because he doesn't love you and it's not because uh, you're under condemnation. It's for some grander reason that is left to the goodness and the sovereignty of God. Because remember, he knows everything. He knows everything. Oh, dear Christian brother and sister, Please go to God with great confidence. Go before him. Go before his presence with great confidence. Don't fear his judgment or rejection because it's not there. It can't be there if, in fact, Jesus is who he said he is and accomplished what he said he accomplished. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He has absolutely and forever declared that he will receive you with joy so go in Jesus' name, trusting in his work and his affection for you. And those condemning voices of your heart will be silenced. A, a heart fully assured before the presence of God knows that condemnation has been removed and that confidence has been given. Well, what kickstarts this whole thing? How, how does this start? How do, we, how, do, how do we get this? Well, he says that this is because of keeping a commandment. Uh, because, here it's on. See, I don't make this stuff up because we keep his commandment and do what pleases him. Though John puts us at the end of the passage, it is in fact the great beginning. It's the cause for our confidence and it's the proof of our condemnation being removed. And I want you to look again what he's talking about. What is this all important commandment? Thank you, John. Thank you, dear old apostle who knows that we need things just straightforward and clear sometimes. Uh, and this is his commandment, that you believe, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. That's the commandment. So we keep the commandment, we believe in Jesus and love one another. And that's what assures us that condemnation is removed and confidence is given. All of our assurance and certainty and confidence and conviction of our standing before God comes from this, that we have put our faith in Jesus Christ and our love for one another is evidence of that. This is exactly what the, the Apostle James says in his short epistle, that faith without works is in fact a dead faith. In other words, any belief that we claim that has no impact on our behavior or never surfaces in our life is is a worthless belief and is not genuine faith that we believe in the Lord in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another. They go together and they go in that order, faith in Jesus, loving one another. And if we don't have faith in Jesus, 
we really can't love one another in, in the way that Christ has loved us. And if we aren't loving one another in the way Christ has loved us, then we have good reason to wonder if we've ever really put genuine faith in the name of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. You see, when our heart condemns us and reminds us of our natural unworthiness before God, remember this, you believe in Jesus. And Jesus is never driven away from the presence of God. And Jesus is always a delight to the Father. That's you when you are in Christ. That's you when you believe in Jesus. Sin is removed. Condemnation is removed. And so confidence and enjoyment can take its place. Here's a fun exercise. Kid, you can do this at home or adults, you can do this too. Get uh, get a jar, maybe like a large mason jar or something, and fill it full of water. Maybe do this outside as I'm thinking about it. Uh, and then just start putting stuff in the water. Fill it until all the water goes out. What, what that is, is the law of displacement because two things can't occupy the same space at the same time. So you've got water in a jar. And as you put stuff in it, uh, if you could, like, I don't know how you could do this. Somebody can figure it out. You blow up a balloon inside of the jar with the water. That balloon is going to expand and take up all of that space when the water has to go out. And that's what we're talking about. As we trust in the name of the Lord Jesus, and as we see and savor and delight in what he's done for us, it is pushing out all of the condemnation that we sometimes hear that it's gone and, and we, as we continue to trust in him it pushes it away so when your heart condemns you when you hear those words of condemnation we turn again to to see jesus and go no that's not me there's no condemnation for me because i'm in christ jesus god gives us his spirit the spirit that confirms who we are and whose we are. He gives us his spirit as proof that we abide in him and, and he abides in us. God abides in you. He lives in you. This is no back and forth with him, without him relationship. No, God's plan and his desire has always been to hold you fast and to keep you forever with him. He abides in you, driving away all condemnation and filling you with confidence in Jesus. What would you say before God if you were absolutely persuaded that he absolutely loves you and wants you with him? How would you come before God? Do that today. There was once a very powerful man uh, who could topple kingdoms and, and alter the course of history. No one approached him without a sense of fear, without a sense of weightiness and respect. Dignitaries, kings, presidents, prime ministers, they all came before him, but with a healthy trepidation, if you will. But there were two people who did not know that kind of approach. Uh, they came before this great man, uh, with full stride and a big smile right into his innermost chambers. And as they entered, the powerful man would smile with delight and greet them with open arms. What, what gave these two individuals in particular so much confidence and freedom? They were his children, and he loved them. This is a picture of President John F. Kennedy in the Oval Office, clapping and laughing with his two children, dancing around. Romans 8 tells us, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have pushed out all condemnation 
by taking it upon yourself. Oh Lord, you did not just ignore our sin. You did not just ignore your justice. You bore it. You took it upon your body so that we could live in freedom. Would you help us, O oh Lord, to enter into your presence today, right now, with this confidence, knowing that you delight in us, you love us, you welcome us, you are overjoyed to have us dancing in your presence. God, I pray for those who are living today under the weight of condemnation. Oh Lord, reveal yourself to them. Show them that you love them and you are their great liberator. Oh God, bring freedom and confidence to us, your people. Lord, help us to go forth today, wherever we go and whatever we do and whoever we see and talk to as ambassadors of, of this great liberation. That we have such good news for our world that, yeah, this world has fallen apart, but we have been rescued out of it and brought into this kingdom that cannot be shaken. Lord, grow us in this deep love. We thank you so much that you know everything and you are greater than our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I encourage you to uh, have a conversation about this, about where you see and feel condemnation creeping into your life with the Lord and maybe with other people and what it would be like to live in a greater sense of this, this kind of confidence, this openness and unencumbered freedom because you know you're so loved. Have a great Sunday. I love you all very much, and I will talk to you soon.